Aleph, if you will. Because I'm at Aleph, it, it, I'm just going to review quickly the Mishnah. The Mishnah there says, nashim, if you find a get, shechure avodim, which is a, 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 a document of emancipation for a slave. We're talking about Evet Kenani, Evet Kenani. A daitiki, that's a deathbed will, matana, the shovrim and receipts. So the Mishnah said, lo yachzor, because sha'ani omer ksuvim heim benimachalem shalalitnam. We fear that he wrote them and then he had charata, he had regret, and he didn't give them. So there's no absolute proof that he gave them. Now, the, the, the Gemara up until now is really only focused on Gitten because Gitten has the, the most serious ramifications of this event. Obviously, we're talking about remarriage and, and, uh, and the purity of, of, of Mishpacha. I mean, a, the ramifications are immense in Gitten. So that's what the Gemara till now has been talking about. And last week we concluded that section. Now the Gemara is going to talk about the rest of the Mishnah. What's the second topic? The second topic is Shechuri Avodim. This is a star of emancipation. It doesn't have the weight of the Doraisa that a get has, of course, but it's still a very critical uh, question as to whether or not a, uh, um, uh, the Torah has a whole portion on Ebed Kanani. So clearly the Torah was talking about uh, emancipation of slaves and notwithstanding what the culture of the country is today or even of the world culture, in Jewish law, there is such a thing as an Eved, uh, but the laws of, of an Eved are so meticulous that one might even say that the onus is greater. In other words, the responsibilities of Avdus are far greater on the master than on the, the servant. So that when you do have a servant, you have obligations that are well beyond what would be a person's normal course of life. So you, you take it very seriously when you have an Evid, what your responsibilities are to that Evid. It's not just he's a piece of furniture or, or he's just, a, 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 I mean, an animal or anything else and you treat him nicely, but you don't have to be, a, no, you have to be overly, overly careful in the way you treat him. So the Good question. Yeah. So just to clarify here, and a little background, because I always get confused about this stuff, and I'm probably not the only one. Maybe I am. We're, when we're talking about an Evid Kanani, and you emancipate an Evid Kanani, it goes from a status of not only being controlled by somebody else, but but having a certain minimal level of mitzvos that they can't do, the most mainly low sases, as I understand it, to going to be coming, do they automatically become a full, they autom I think they automatically become a full Jew, or is that only if they want to? Because if it's automatically that they become, then there are major halakhic ramifications because you would change the status of the person. No, they do become. In other words, they are right. Megayer as a result of leaving the status of an Eved, they become a Jew. You're right. So it has, therefore, similar ramifications to what you have with the with a get because you're really changing the status. This person now could marry a Jew or not marry a Jew, et cetera, things like that. Right. No, I, I, I'm not minimizing that a star shifter isn't isn't okay. something that has a great deal of weight to it. I was only uh, ascribing to the fact that the Gemara chose to talk about Gittin because the impact of a get is immediate and everlasting. With an right. Evan, you can say, oh, he becomes a Jew. Yes, there are many issues. Right. We're talking about an Evan. And not, then there's not one other aspect, maybe, maybe why the Gemara didn't consider it the same, which is that Bisman Azeb, but really Bisman, the Gemara in, in Babel, certainly Gittin mattered then, they matter now. But whereas the Evid Kanani was is only, I think, only in Israel and only under certain circumstances, so it's therefore less applicable directly. Less applicable. That, that's right. That's why that's why the Gemara chose to really focus the discussion on Gitan. And now you'll see that the section on average Shifra is very small because it's somewhat repetitive, but it has a couple of of of, of twists that aren't with Gitan. But by and large. It follows that same pattern, but you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, uh, and Ebed Kanani becomes uh, becomes halachically a Jew when yes. when you yeah, shacher him with 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 uh, with freedom. Correct. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Correct. So okay. so therefore, th those are very important uh, considerations for for an Ebed. And we're going to see now in the Gemara. We're going to see now in the Gemara. To that point that you just raised, Menashe. Is that there are zechusim and chayvos? There's reasons why he wants to become emancipated, and reasons why he doesn't want to become emancipated. 
There's this, there's a force that an Eved should stay. He would want to be an Eved because like we all know, the burdens of, of a Jew are great, right? Not everybody wants to undertake that burden. He's perfectly happy being an Eved Kanani in the home of a Jew and, and life is good. And we're gonna see that he can live the life of a, of a Goy, of an Eved. He can live the life of an Eved there, which in many ways is, is freedom. There's, he's an Eved, but there's freedom. When, when you become free, you're free, but, you're, but you have chayvus. So you see, it's, it's, it works both ways, both sides of the coin. You're free, but you have more obligations. You're not free, you have chayvus, but, but, but I can do what it's I want free, to do. It's, it's free to Eved Hashem versus Eved of, of another person. That's exactly right. And, and of course, the Torah says you should be Eved, not an Eved to an Eved, you should be an Eved to the Rabbi Shalom. So that's the ultimate goal, but an Eved Kanani, um, you know, to some degree has that, uh, I'll say choice, it's not quite choice, but yeah, he has that, um, that ability. All right, so let's look at the Gemara and understand what the Gemara is telling us. And by the way, I just want to say, Rabbi Hyatt always describes uh, the Ebed as, as akin to being on a sports team in terms of the owner's responsibilities. It's not just like you're treated like a bad slave who whips you but it's like more like you're on a baseball or football team and the owner has responsibility. Has responsibility. Right? You're yeah. on the team. And, yeah. uh, you know, absolutely. absolutely. for him, but, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what it's, it's not it's clear you would be better off as an Eved. Exactly right, <laughs> which is why an Eved oftentimes doesn't want to be free. He'd rather have, you know, life is regulated, but life can be good. So once you get used to the regulation, the daily, this, this, and this, Life is good. I have no, I have no obligations. So the, the master gives me everything and everything. So wh why, why do I want to go free? I mean, there are, there are people who have been imprisoned who after a number of years, they no longer want to be free because they don't know what to do when they're free. And you see that recidivism in freedom is high because people don't know what to do. So when, when you have a, a, a regulated life, albeit restricted, that's for many people that you know, you have peace of mind. You go to sleep at night, you get up in the morning. I mean, you have everything you want. So let's take a look at the Gemara. Tana Rabbanon. Motzashtar shichur b'shuk. Same circumstances we had with Gittin. If you found a, 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 a document which was emancipation for a slave, and you found it in the marketplace, and we know that the caravans go, so that we know that there's a hustle and bustle. Bazman shaharav mode. When the master admits Yes, I gave that star shikhra to the Ebed. Yachzir, you give it to him. Yachzir la Ebed. Ein harav mode, if, they, if the Rav says he's silent, he doesn't admit or deny, lo yachzir, lo loze, velo lozne. You don't give it to either. Now, in the case of Gittin, we explained all of that, and we said that the, the pros and cons, you can't give it to either one, because either one, there could be a, 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 a deleterious effect a, a negative effect, so you can't give it. Here too, there's an effect. We'll see what that is in a minute, but you don't give it. Now, what does the Gemara say? Is man shaharav mode when the rab is mode? Frek the Gemara mir yachsa eved. Do you really return it to the to the to the eved when the rab is mode? Va'amai, why would you return it? Nechosh, let us be afraid. Shemakosov litnlo benison, the famous nissen and tishri scenario. He wrote the Shtar Shifro in Nisan, Lo Nisan Lo Atishre. And six months later in Tishrei, he gave. He gave it to him. Now, what happened in those six months? Ba'ozal Avda, the servant goes. Now, this is a little ambiguous because Koma Shikona Evet Konarabo. So, what does the Evet have of his own? So, the Gemara seems to make an assumption. Ba'ozal Avda, and he had some pocket change, he had some money. Ba'kona Nechosen. And he, he himself, the Evid, went out. In other words, he probably got a wage. And that wage, you know, which was fair. And the, so he, he saved his money. And he had enough to buy a piece of property. So what did he do? Between Nissan and Tishrei. Now, mind you, he doesn't know about this uh, 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 Shtar Shikra. The, 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 the rabbi doesn't have to give him advance notice. I'm emancipating you. So he writes the Shtar Shikra in Nissan, holds on to it in his pocket, right? And what happens? Um, he buys property from Nisan to Tishrei, right? He gives money to people, buys the property. 
is vine or mafikle shikhar because of benison with the turf of kucha shalaki din. And what happens? He goes to have, so he, the ever thinks that he owns the property, right? Because he he bought it from his own money, and he then gives him the shtar shikhar in tishrei, but he collects all the money and the, everything that happened between this and Tishrei goes to the Baal. So who is going to be put out? All those people who sold to the Evid, thinking that the Evid, well, you know, it's fine. The Evid, I, I can transact with the Evid. Maybe he made an announcement. He said, oh, this is, you know, there's going to be a Shtar Shikra. He went ahead and transacted. The, the, the master can now go and between Nisan and Tishrei, collect everything, just like by Gittin. The same situation that we have by Gittin we have here is that six months in Tereganum between Nisan and Tishrei is a gray area, and the, the Baal will go ahead and collect everything, so all of those people who transacted with the Evid are going to be in jeopardy. But again, they're transacting with the Evid. The Evid knew that he is still an Evid, right? The Evid knew he was an Evid, but but and he, had he has money. He happens to have money, whether from a wage or whatever. It's personal money, right? Um, and so he makes deals with people, right? Uh, and tells them six months from now it'll all be good. That kind right. Of Excuse me, Rabbi. Rabbi. Yes. There are three members who just joined, and I think that refers Shlema. Uh, Michael, you want to go first? Yeah, Michael. Um. Thanks, Jay. Um, Prosper Ben Aliza. Prosper Ben Aliza. Sora Bas Esther. Sora Bas Esther. Marissa Bas Toby. Marissa Bas Toby. Thank you. Okay, Joe, you're next. I'm going across my screen. Nothing. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, you muted Jonathan, so we can't hear you. You're still muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Maryasha Meta but Risha Miriam. Maryasha Meta Marisha Miriam? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Reverend. Yeah. So 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 what's gonna happen here is that the the Evet is gonna do these transactions between Nissan and Tishrei, and then the and then the master is who had written the Shtar Shikra and Nissan but didn't give it, didn't give it. Is go is going to say well all those transactions between Nissan and Tishrei really belong to me. But so, I'm still hung up on this. Um, does the Eva tell he discloses full disclosure to the people he's transacting with, saying the reason this yes I'm an Eva or or he doesn't say anything at all or does he say yes I'm an Eva but this will well, no good. fine everybody knows he's an Eva everybody knows he's an Eva but since he has his own money money which the master gave him to be his, right, to be his, he can, he can go ahead and he can have, have. He can take, he can therefore buy land and give a landowner money. Right, but, but everybody knows. The land, and no, it's his because he was paid away. Right, was. but everybody knows that the master would have rights to that land. In other words, that's not a, a, a doubt. The master has a right to the land that the Ebbet buys, he does. But it's still the Ebbet. They still the Evid. The problem is going to be. But, but is the land still the Evid, even though the master has a right to the land? No, it's not the Evid. It's not the Evid. But the Evid still took his own money from his wage and bought the land. Right. But it's. Okay. But it's right. All right. Now, now comes Tishrei, the Evid gets the, the, the uh, star. Okay. Everything good? Why did the Eved do this before he is, was Mishtachrer by the Baal? Why did the Eved do this? Well, okay, so you're asking a question, why did the Eved transact and buy property? Before um, he knew he had a clear way to his freedom, or did he think he'll have freedom in six months? Maybe he anticipated he would have freedom in six months. I mean, okay. the, the, the question is, okay, it's a good question. And the deal is to be made now, because this is the opportunity kind of thing? Okay. Right, right. So now comes Tishrei, and he gets the star, right? He gets the star. Now, everybody out there knew he was a servant until Tishrei. But once the Evet gets a hold of the star, what's the date of the star? Nissen. Nissen. Oh, 
So he's going to go back to the same people with whom he transacted, whose property now is being owned by the master, and he's going to go back and say, wait a minute, uh, you, you, you can't do that. I was the owner in this, and you've got to give me back the money. So it's the Evid who is going to do the deed that will cause the Lekuchin to be damaged, just as in the case of Gittin. So in other words, the Nisan, the Nisan Tishrei scenario can apply anywhere. And, and the big problem is, is the deception it will cause if it wasn't given between those two months and what can happen in terms of transactions, other material events that happen, where someone can say, wait a minute, you didn't know it, but I was really freed from this and I didn't say anything to you. I didn't have to say anything to you. And now this poor Lukuchen, these, the, these buyers out there, they're going to be shortchanged because at the end of the day, they're going to be left holding the bag. It's not right. It's not correct. But technically, this, how else will you define it? He has a, he has a, a, a star shitra. Remember, the, the nuances of giving and all these things, that's only known between the parties. The world doesn't know. The world knows that a, a star shikra was written. It's in the courthouse. Fine. Everybody knows. What happened after that? Nobody knows. So the mafreya, a year, two, three years later, everybody forgot about it. All of a sudden, this Eved is going to come out of the woodwork and say, you know, uh, John, remember three years ago, we, there was a transaction and this, that, and the other. I was the owner. Here's my star. Give me back my money. Give me back my land. And by then, people have long since forgotten what happened and what the timing was. This is a time bomb waiting to happen because of that problem. So the Kasha on the Gemara is, how can you say that if the Rav is Mode? If the Rav says, yes, I gave it to him, that I gave it to him, and therefore you, you have to, you have to, um, uh, uh, you have to give it back to him. Why would you give it back to him? But for the Nisan Tishrei scenario that always lingers, that's the Gemara's Kasha. Same Kasha. Question. question. It, yeah. it seems like this is, it, it's sort of the same Kasha, but it's the flip. If I remember, if I understand this correctly, which I might not. Back with the Gittin, it was a situation that the Baal was making money off of the Nisei Malug. The Nisei Malug of the woman's property. And here in a, it, it's sort of the flip. The, 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 uh, the Eved has money, but then is buying mm -hmm. property that then goes to the Baal. No, no, but the, the owner is entitled to that money. In other words, yes, yes, he can. Even though he gave it to him as a wage or whatever, whatever the Evan owns, owns, owns is in turn the property of the Baal. Right. Okay. So once the Baal owns it, right. then then he can transact. He can he can right right. But the maybe the party. reason we need to have this separate thing is that it's sort of a flip over which party is doing which. Even though the end result is that the the, the owners would be the original owners would be out. Right. Doubled. So why did the owner accept the money if he, it was his money to be owner? So he gets his money and he gets the land and they, the uh, this and, and, and Evan words, gets nothing. Well, uh, right, because the Evan is this is the is the possession of the owner. The so owner might have the owner might have thought as follows. You know what? I'm going to give my uh, my Evan a wage. I'm going to let him go buy things. Now, of course, everything he buys belongs to him, but he's going to give him that leeway. The Ebbet goes ahead and says, you know what? I would like to have maybe for my future security, I'd like to have a plot of land that I can farm. He goes ahead and buys the plot of land and, and everything is good. The owner then decides, you know what? Even though I gave him the money and I meant it to be for him, he bought this plot of land. I really like this plot of land. I'm entitled to it. I'm the owner. Even though I gave him the money for the wages, I'm still entitled to it. Now he can decide to take it or not. Okay, you say he's a bad guy. You're going to say he's a bad guy. He took the land, but he took it, and he's yeah. entitled to take it. So he's a bad guy, but he took the land, and now he sold it to a third person, and he took the money. But it, it, earlier, earlier you said that everybody knows he's an Evid. So why right. did anybody do any kind of business with him if everybody knew well, he because was they knew they were doing business with the Baal, even though he was an Evid and had the money, they knew they were doing. They knew anybody who bought knew that they were 
possibly engaging with the with the owner. But that's not the problem, Jay, because whether you whether you engage with the owner or you engage with the Eved, it's a legitimate sale. It's only illegitimate now because of that star shift where being predated. That's why it becomes a problem is but because you, the owner had no right. Jay, I as well understand. The owner had, the owner had, didn't the owner have an obligation to reveal what the situation no, was? No, no, not, not at all. Not at all. Now, again, it, it, it's unfair because he gave the Evan the money, but, but you know what? It's like a yo-yo. He gave him the, you know, the guy grabbed the yo-yo, but the Evan, the ba bastard could still yank it back. Now, if he's a nice guy, he says, you know what? It's his, it's okay. But I'll pee halacha, he has the right. So if he says, I like that piece of farmland, I, I you know, I'm going to, I can capitalize on it. He's a bad guy, but halachically he can do it. So now he goes and sells it to the third person. And the third person says, that's fine. I'm dealing with a, an owner who owns a, a slave and an owner. I have no reason to worry. I have no reason to worry. Only later does he find out when the Evan produces a star shikhr that was dated prior to the date of the transaction. <laughs> then he's going to say, oh my goodness, what, what's going on here? And the Evan's going to say, sorry, my friend, you had, you know, the, Evan, the, the master had no right to do it. You, you do it at your own peril. So that's going to be the, the that's why the Gemara is asking the Kasha, why do we allow the Rav to be mode? When that could lead to such a problem, yeah, Menashe. Two things. So one is it's reminded sort of the situation of you hear about every so often in prisons they have it in some places, but also even like some of these big public works projects a century ago, stuff where you would have a company town and the the, the laborers would be get paid paid wages, but they had to turn around and use the wages to pay inflated prices for food and, and everything else. Right. And the only place they could buy it was back from the same company that paid them. Right. So everything went around in a circle. Well, right. um, the other thing though, is that this slave, everybody knows he's a slave. So he goes out and, and, and goes to buy a piece of property for a thousand dollars and hands a person the cash. And the people aren't even gonna question. They're not gonna worry about, was this really the slave's money? Right. Or was this really the Baal's money? They're gonna assume he's operating on top on the behalf of the Baal. That, that, that's correct, that's correct. So there will be no chashash in anybody's mind that this isn't a legitimate transaction. That's the problem. So we're focusing on the inequity of the Baal, of the Baal taking away the Evans property. Yes, okay, that's not fair. He gave him the money. He should have done it. Fine, but so so that's that's a the tevasa. Yes, he should. Yeah, no, he shouldn't. But al pi halacha, he's allowed to do it. So once he does it, and the buyer of that property relies on it, now you're upending the whole system by saying that now the evit can come back and undo what was done six months ago, a year ago, whatever. So the Kasha then falls back. Why do we believe the Baal when he says, yes, I gave him the Shtar Shikhar? Look what can happen as a result of that sort of fallacy, as, as a result of him saying, yes, I gave it to him. Look at what it can undo, just like by Git, it can undo something. And by Get, of course, we're talking about Yisuri Deoraisa. Let's say, like you said, you're, you're right, Menashe, that there's all kinds of Fiyuvim on the Evet, but the ramifications are not necessarily as great as they are for Gidden, although it's bad enough. But, 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 but here, you know, so what's going to happen? So now the Gemara wants to distinguish, and this is what we started out talking about at the very beginning when we talked about, is it a merit or not a merit for an Eved to be, to be free? You have a machloikis between two Amaroim, which impacts that. Says the Gemara, he nicha, it's right to give it back to the Eved, Lamanda Oma Zuchusula Eved, that it's a zchus, it's a merit, it's a positive thing for an Eved to be freed. Sheyotza Metachas Rabo Lecherus. Then I, I can agree if there's a question and the Rav, the master says, Yes, I gave it to him, of course he wants to have it because he now goes free, and that's a zchus. In other words, if, if you are an objective person and you look at an Eved, and you say, is it better for him to be free or not to be free? So that's what the Machoikis is. The Manda Omar says, no, it's always better for the Evan to be free. My opinion. 
I, I'm, I'm looking at it from my view. Yes, it's better for him to be free because now he's a Shaima Mitzvah and everything else. Evan might not think so, but I think so. Now, so according to that, Manda Omar, Abaya, and according to the Shita of Abaya, the Omar Eid of Bechosma Zochem Lo, remember we've said in the past that um, that Zochem La Adam Shalom Bechonah. Remember we said that for a positive thing, you can be a shaliach for a positive thing, even though he is not there or doesn't even know about it. In other words, someone wants to give a diamond to, 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 to my wife and, and I'm the shaliach, right? I mean, it, it, this is mundane, but you know, even in the mitzvah. Okay, so I can be the shaliach for a positive thing. Ah, she doesn't know about it. She doesn't have to know about it. It's a schus. It's a positive thing. Let's talk about a mitzvah. Okay, a person wants to be bestow, bestow um, a mitzvah on someone else by giving him a pair of tefillin. Okay, I can be the shliach for a pair of tefillin to take it for him without him knowing it because it's schus. So Abayah says, Zachel Adam Shalom So now think about this for a minute. If a person writes a Shtar Shikhar, Eva doesn't even know about it. The person who writes it, the Adam who sign it, they're signing on behalf of the Evet to give him. Remember, a Evet doesn't have a choice in the matter. He can't say, thank you very much. I don't want to be free. It's up to the Rav. It's up to the master. The master wants him to be free. He says, I want you to become a Shem and Torah Mitzvah. I want you to be a good person. And I'm writing you. The Evet, not so happy, but. Okay, now, who is the imprimatur of the Shtar Shikra? The Adim. The Adim signed the Shtar Shikra. The minute they sign, they're zochen la'odam shaloi b'fano. They've already put the imprimatur of this emancipation document. No choice to the Evan. He's already free. It doesn't matter if he knows about it or not. So that's the situation. According to the man, the Omer, that it's a schus. And according to Abaya, that it happens automatically. We understand why the Gemara says, okay, if, you, if the Rob says give it, you give it. Because it's all positive. It's all good things. Uh, Rabbi, There's no why, reason not to why, give it. I, Rabbi, why, would, why would the Torah give an Evid Ivri the right to reject freedom and not the Evid Kanani? I'm sorry, say it again, David. Say it again. Why would the Torah, why would the Torah give the Evid Ivri the right to reject freedom and become a, a and remain a slave until... Uh, because, he's because he's an Ivri. He's still doing mitzvahs. He's still doing... In other words, the, the, the difference is that the status of an Evid Kanani changes with the Shikhar, the status of an Evid, yes, he's, 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 he's a, 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 you know, you, you, you pin his ear and you say that you shouldn't be an Evid, but he, he's, his status hasn't changed. He's still, in other words, we're looking at from the, stat, from the standpoint of what's good for the Evid. And we're saying it's good for the Evid to be a Yid. So an Evid, if he is a Yid all along, Yes, he has a chryas because he was punished. It's more of because he, the, 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 there are several reasons why he became an Evan Ivory, but let's say he became an Evan Ivory for, for, for reasons that he was destitute and did this and that and the other. And he says, you know what? I like this situation. I'm very comfortable. I want to be an Evan Lilo. So then, you, you, okay, but he's still an Evan Ivory. And Evan Kanani, on the other hand, has no choice on the matter. And so if you say it's a schus for him, whether he believes it or not, then it's a schus. And Zachim Adam Shloy Bafanov, that's why we can give the Shtar Shikhr right away because there's only good things happening. But let's just finish this. According to the Manda Omer and that Machlech is Amaroim, who says, wait a minute, it's not so good for the Evid. It's a chov. It's not so great for him to be free. And Rashi says because if he was if he was married into a, if he was working for a kohen he can have truma he can he, he can have relations with a woman there's no achrayas to be married does not in other words these are considered to be all positive things for the evet which he has to give up remember he has to give up his freedom and he has to be he has to he has to be, be married to a woman under under the the laws of, of, of Moshe Messina Torah Messina. That's not what he wants. He wants to be Hefker. He wants to be able to do what he does when he does it. And he wants to be able to eat Truma from a Kayan. And he wants the good life. The good life you're not going to get when you become a Yid. <laughs> so in his view, that's not such a great thing. And 
what do we say? You can't make it worse. You can't put obligations on a person. You can do schus and mitzvahs, but not but not chayvus. So Rabbi not Raman, I'm, I'm just curious about an evet ivri. Um, can an evet ivri, um, can, can a Baal actually tell an evet ivri, um, sorry, I don't want you. I mean, the evet ivri can say, I want to be yours, and you, you punch his ear, and, and you know. He, he has that right. Yeah, he has but, that right. But the Baal can still say to him, I appreciate it, but no. Well, okay, so th so then then um, I'm just asking because because it tells well, you what to do when he when he you know he should be free, but he says I want to be I want to stay with you. So I mean, under the circumstance where he insists that he wants to be free, uh, that he wants to stay in Eved La'Olam, but the Baal didn't want this. He, the Baal didn't didn't want it. Says so, no. Yeah. So so the question is, does the Baal have the right yes. to reject him? So um, I have to look more carefully because the entire focus of the Torah is not on the Baal, it's on the Evet. In other words, that he's an Evet La'olam. And if he's an Evet La'olam because he wants to be, then it seems like the master should adopt that and 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 uh, and keep him. But uh, let, let me look a little bit more into that because that's a very yeah. interesting question. What happens if he says, I can no longer afford you. I can no longer have you as an as, a, as an Evan. What do I do? I should have some rights in the matter. So Lechaira, he should be able to overrule. But let me hold off and um, and remind me next week. I'm going to look at it and remind me next week. But so, but according to this Shita, that it's, it's a Chayv Le'evet, but Ma'i Kalameimer, what are you going to say? Why are you going to give the, the, the master the right to say, I gave it to him. It's not a good thing if you give him that right because he's, put, he's putting Chayvus on the Evan and the Evan doesn't want that. So, the, so it's a good Kasha. In other words, if you say it's a good thing, okay, I understand why the Rav has, has the right to say unilaterally, yes, I gave it to him. He lost it, but I gave it to him. Or I lost it, and it's his. But according to the one who says it's a chov, why does he have that right? So what are you going to say? If you also, the mitra of Ominulei, I saraya, Amos, Matra, Shichwil, Yazba. So in other words, we're going to give the same answer we gave by Gitten. What's the kasha? The kasha is if he, uh, the Nisan and Tishrei scenario, it's going to be wreak havoc on the whole system because he will do all these transactions and then the Evid will come back and say, you know what, I was free in this and I'm buying all this back. Then we're going to answer what we answer by getting. Show us the date you got the document. Remember, that's how we answered it in Gittin, is that we're not worried because he's going to have to prove when he got it. If he has to prove when he gets it, Clearly, he's going to have to show, I got it in Tishrei, not in Nissan. So those buyers between Nissan and Tishrei will not forfeit their land. So that's how the Gemara answers the question, according to that Manda Omar, who says that it's a negative for the Eved, and therefore the Eved doesn't want it. And therefore, it's still okay for the master to say, yes, I gave it, because the, there will still be protection for those buyers who bought the land between this and the tissue. That's how the Gemara answers that question. So let's take a look at Rashi. So Rashi says, <clears throat> oh, we have to go further up, about the middle of the page, Zechusu Le'evet. Take a look at Rashi, Zechusu Le'evet. Tovu hu eslo shematiro bekahal. It's good that he is uh, freed into the kahal Hashem, the given the zechusu, inka letzute the mishas, shenichtam zeichem b'shichur, right? Like a motor star get Liode, Nasa Ben Chayrim, and Mafreya, Mishas Chasima. So that's all fine and good that he was already freed from the time, from the original time, and therefore um, it, it, it was his. But if you say Chovu Le Eve, that it's a Chov, Chovoso Hisha Yotze Mach Mitachas Rabba Kloma, Hefsen Hulo, he's losing. Shim Evet Kohen who Poslam and Atruma. Now he can no longer eat Truma. Imshal Yisrael Asura B'shitcha Kananis, and if he and if he's a, 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 a Jew, he's also to Shitcha Kananis. The Zilale, the Shichale, the Pritzale, this you know, this this Zole or the Sove, the Pritzus, all these things that he has the, the benefit of as a Kanani, he no longer has. So that's the basic intrinsic machlokes between Chos and Chov. So the Gemara asks, My Eimer, if you're going to say it's a Chov. Then why would we give the raw the the master the right to unilaterally say I, I gave it that I did give it to him? 
the hash the lekel amema ada b'chos mav chavon lo the ain chavon lo adam shlo b'fana like we said ain chavon lo adam so it's a bad thing. All right. So now, so that's the end of the of the whole Indian. You see, the whole thing is wrapped up in just a few lines because in Shikhar, it's it's whereas in Gitten, there's so many more ramifications. Even though we said before, you're right that Shikhar does pose all kinds of new obligations on, on an event. Nevertheless, uh, it, he has certain uh, uh, rights and obligations, but they don't rise to the level of Gitten. So we're not more. Okay. That's fairly straightforward. Now we're going to go and look at the at the sort of the last part or the next part of the Mishnah on Yudchesam and Aleph. It talked about Daitike Matana Vishoga. And we explained what is a Daitike. A Daitike is a deathbed will. Now let, let's stop and explain a couple of things about a deathbed will. What's the difference between a will that a person writes in his life and a person uh, and and okay. So the whole question of wills, by the way, is a big issue in halacha as to whether or not a person, the way we understand wills in secular society, you buy the last will and testament, you list all of your assets, you list everything in your whole life, and basically you you say, this is what I want to happen with my nechassim uh, after I pass away. That, that's simply what a will is. In Jewish law, that's not so simple. Because there's some things that call, that are called a kosher will, a Jewish will, because technically there are rights that people have in a person's nechassim, right? Not the state, as you you'd want popular culture to to assume that the state has a right to take everything you own. No, you have a wife, you have children, you have uh, obligations to people for whom to whom you they have an automatic right in what you have. You don't have a choice in the matter. So that poses a problem. So, so what, what's the answer? So there's a couple of ways. Again, I won't go into the details of how to write a will, but the, 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 the answer is there's, there's two streams of giving, if you will. There's the one stream of giving where basically you, you, you say in life, I'm giving this. In other words, it's yeah, I'm giving it to those who have, you can give to a variety of people. You have obligations to some, and but you can give to a variety. You can give to charities, you can give to uh, Yisraelim, you can give to whoever you want. So you give those gifts in life and you indicate, this is what I want to happen. So you, you give it to those who have automatic rights, and then you give it to people who don't have automatic rights that you want to give it to. That's how generally it's structured. And what do you do? You have to make a Kenyan. You have to make a Kenyan, just like with any other uh, uh, giving, you have to make a Kenyan, Kenyan Suda or whatever it happens to be. And that's fine, halakhically correct. Now, you have a situation where a person is Nabach on his deathbed or he feels that his time is up and he has, you know, he, has, he wants to do tshuva, he wants to do things that maybe he didn't do in his lifetime. So he says, you know what? I want certain things to be, to make requests and things before I die. The Torah is very sensitive to a person in that matzav. And they say, what the Torah says is that they can write what we call a daitike. It's a deathbed will. And it doesn't need a Kenyan. Normally, everything we do in life to transact requires a Kenyan. We know that. And there's, there's tremendous volumes of, 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 um, of halacha and, and, and discussion about Kabbalah's Kenyan. All of a sudden, the person's on his deathbed. He wants to make a bequest. And the Torah says, you don't need a Kenyan. You can do it without a Kenyan. There is a hitch, however. What's the hitch? The hitch is, and, and that's what the Gemara is now we're going to start talking about, is that when you give a deathbed will, you have to enunciate a certain formula for how you're giving the deathbed will. And essentially what you're saying is, I'm giving this to you now, but it will vest with you after I die. In other words, the way you structure the deathbed will leaves a little bit, of, let's call it, ambiguity, if you will, but not, okay, it leaves a little bit of a gap, 
that when you give it to him now, you're giving it to him to the exclusion of anybody else, but he has no rights to it. He has no rights. The only rights he has is la'acham misa. So that's a little tricky because when you're giving a regular gift, what's called a, a, a matnas bari, which the Gemara will explain, the gift of a healthy person, you give it to him, it's not yours anymore. Kenyan is made, right. You end, you end it by giving it to him. Lock stock, it's no, there's no condition. If you give a gift on a condition and you're healthy, meaning you're not at the deathbed, that's considered similar to a deathbed gift. So in other words, you can give a gift outright. You can give a, 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 die decay, a deathbed bequest, which is conditional. And you can give a regular bequest, which is conditional, and it's similar to a deathbed gift. So you have sort of three categories. Well, why isn't the third category similar to the deathbed utterance? What's it, the difference? It, it is. They're, they're it the is. Same. They're the same. They're the same. Okay. We, we call it a gift in life, but it is a, the equivalent of a deathbed utterance. And so why don't we just, why do we have a deathbed utterance? Why don't we just say there's a category of gift that you're saying, I give this to you in the event that I die? It doesn't matter if you're healthy or not. Why do we even have right. a distinction? Because, because most, most non-deathbed gifts are not given that way. Understood. Right. In other words, most gifts are given as a gift. You give it as a gift. Right. You don't, you don't, you know, play, play, you know, like a yo-yo where you pull it back. Right. It's, it's these, something you do when you're very sick. Because if there's a reason survive, right, there's a, I, right, right. right. There's a reason for it. That, well, that, if I survive, I may, I, I don't want to do this. It's only right. if, so, right. so, so listen how sensitive the Torah is. The Torah mm -hmm. says that when a person is on his deathbed, he has certain emotions that we don't want to, we don't want to interrupt. We don't want to say, make it difficult for him because that may only exacerbate his illness and may make him more forlorn in the time when he needs all his strength. So the Torah says, you know what? We're going to forgo the Kenyan part, which is major. You don't have to have a Kenyan. All you have to do is you have to utter it in a certain fashion, which someone standing there can help him utter, which we'll see. It's only a few words. And with that, we know that he made a daitike. He made a deathbed will. Lahavdil, in our secular law, we have all kinds of laws of hearsay. Hearsay means that it's not a direct testimony. It's a testimony through a third person. And in many cases, that's not allowed in a court of law. You're not allowed to have hearsay. There's something called a deathbed utterance where you're lying on your deathbed and you make a statement and someone says, on his deathbed, he said such, and it's excluded from hearsay. It's admissible. It carries more weight in civil law. It's, right. It, it's, her, it's hearsay. It's, it's no less or more hearsay than someone who does it on the street. Parents is that deathbed utterances and daitikis, all of these things have a certain place in our society where we make exemptions and exceptions and say, if such and such happens, we're going to allow it. But then why is it allowed in the second? Because the Torah is sensitive. I mean, even, I guess, even secular. I mean, we're all sensitive to people who are in their last stages of life that we don't want to aggravate them and make them more upset, which could hasten their death. I mean, right, but, but then why do we similarly allow it in the second case you mentioned that a healthy person can also? Be, because a person, we say the general, we'll see why a person can give a gift that way. I mean, again, it has nothing to do with deathbed or anything else. Right. It's, it's a matnas bari. It's equivalent to a, a, a deathbed, but it's not. Well, that's a separate Rabbi, section we'll talk yeah. about. But basically, Rabbi. we have the two main categories of healthy giving and deathbed giving. Yeah, Michael. Conditional. You can have conditions. So if I say um, I'm, I'm healthy, I'm going to say uh, it conditioned on if you get married, to your son or daughter. When I die, you get this inheritance. You can Correct. do that Correct. before the deathbed. You can do that on the deathbed. Correct. So it's the same. But there is there a distinction between the two because you can make that same conditional one way or another. And is there any thought to the frame of mind of the individual when they make the declaration on their deathbed. 
No, what, what, what you mean to assume that a deathbed, a person may be frail of mind and not thinking. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so the, the halacha the, the, doesn't say that. It doesn't say that a person on his deathbed has is, is has has a diminished capacity or whatever. Uh, and you know, lahavla. When we see today that people challenge wills and everything that a person wasn't of sound mind and sound body and everything else, the Torah doesn't really engage in that discussion. The Torah says that, and again. Now you're dealing with halacha, modern halacha, and how to interpret the Torah, because the Torah didn't talk about Alzheimer's. The Torah didn't talk about dementia. So today, al halacha, you have all these questions that come up, and, 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 and really, which, which are very tricky as to how to deal with them. Did a person really mean to say what he said if he was not uh, mentally uh, capable? But to your point, Michael, as to the, uh, the live giving to the son if he'll marry and otherwise, the punchline. So you have to understand because we're gonna, what's the reason behind all of this? The reason behind all of this is that when a person makes a conditional gift or a deathbed gift, he doesn't a hundred percent mean it. In other words, the timing of him giving it, whether it's emotional or whether because he wants to induce his son or daughter to marry or whatever the circumstance has a hint of doubt to it. Therefore, we give the giver the prerogative. What happens if the deathbed will he, miraculously he recovers? All of a sudden, he's 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 a gosses, and then several days later, my goodness, he's I mean, you know, he's 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 starting to get better. He's not going to die of, of of the of the stroke or of cancer or something. It gets better. Torah gives him the opportunity of having charata. So that's the big issue here. He can have charata, whether it's a, a healthy gift or whether it's a deathbed gift, that distinguishes it from a regular gift where once you give it, it's given, you can no longer pull it back. That's the huge difference. And it makes, in the Gemara, you'll see all the ramifications of giving a healthy, regular gift or of giving one conditional or a dipicate. That's huge, uh, Menashe. So we actually have a, a very uh, a example in the Torah related to this, which is Yitzchak. He thought he was on his deathbed. I think he actually lived quite a bit longer. But here he is giving these brachas and the to 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 Yaakov. Maybe he knew it was Asa, to, to thinking he was Asav and so on. And the of coming saying, "No, you tricked you," and all this stuff, and, and you know, all playing that he couldn't see and and all this stuff. And it it was. Uh, uh, and the question then of later on of you know who got what which inheritance and and so on. But but remember, Yitzchak said to Asaph, "I can no longer take it back. Right. I gave the bracha. I can't take it back." So right. if, if you want to touch it, if you want to explain it, that it, it, yes, he was on in years and ill and all, but it he, he, it was not a daitike. It was not a deathbed confession or a deathbed will. He gave it of his own free right, will. but it but it relates to all these issues. It relates to the issues, right? Right. So, so again, it makes it very, very difficult and tricky if a person survives the deathbed illness and then later says, "I have, I have karata. But, but that's the that's the one distinguishing factor is that we're going to allow it to be. Remember, once you make a Kenyan with someone, that's totally irrecoverable. If you make a Kenyan to close the transaction, that is done. We're allowing the die ticket to happen without a Kenyan. And we're saying that it can be forever. But it also allows you to undo it because you didn't seal it with a Kenyan. So that Kenyan is a double-edged sword here because a Kenyan makes it fait accompli. In the case of a die ticket, you don't need a Kenyan. But on the other hand, even though you don't need a Kenyan, you still have a, 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 a way out. And that's what makes it what it is. So let's take a look. We're going to start this. This is a very tricky. It's not complicated, but it's a little. It's 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 tricky. So let's start and let's start with the Gemara and the Mitzvah. We'll pick it up. Daitike amatana tana rabban ezehi daitike. What is a daitike? Now here, clearly, these are the words. Da tehe lemekim belios. Da tehe lemekim belios. Take a look at Rashi. Da tehe lemekim belios. Star ze yeh lakum mean forever, ulios and enduring. I mean permanent. Bechol hakosov bo with everything written. 
the Dibre Shriv Mara, the words of a Shriv Mara, a deathbed uh, person, Kaksuvin Umisurin Dami. It's like they were written and sealed. No Kenyan, written and sealed forever, except that it's not forever. Right? It's forever, except that it's not forever. Because we don't assume a Shiv Mara is going to survive. But if a Shiv Mara survives, then it's not forever. That's what makes it complicated. And that's, you'll see how the Gemara goes into different situations where, because of a deathbed uh, a gift, how you treat that later, if in fact he survives. That's the big Rabbi, question. Rabbi, one point of clarification. If he made a a will before his deathbed with a Kenyan, and then he tries to contradict that with a deathbed will, he cannot contradict what was already set up with a Kenyan. Okay, so Michael, let's be careful on the terminology. If he made not a, we're not gonna call it a will, we're gonna call that he made gifts in his lifetime. Because again, we started by saying that a will is a complicated thing in a halakha. Right, okay. So, so, so if you give a gift, and your intention as a healthy person, a bari, your, your, your intention to give a gift, that gift is irreversible. That gift is a gift and it's how it, 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 it applies the moment you give it. A, the, the distinction there is that in a deathbed giving, it applies now, but only until after death, if after death. So yes, it's yours today, meaning I can't turn around and give it to somebody else. A deathbed will that I gave to you, I can't give to Ruve. But if I survive, then I can pull it back from you. I can give it to Ruven Shimalevi, anybody I want. But we're assuming he won't survive. And therefore the Torah made it easy for a Shiv Marah to give a gift without the formality of a Kenyan because it will, it'll affect his health even in the last minutes. But he cannot contradict the earlier gift that was made with a Kenyan with his deathbed. Correct. Rate. Correct. He cannot undo what was do, what was done done as a healthy gift. That's absolutely correct. Now, so Dotehe the Makin Malios, it's it, it's good for today and into the future, right? Now, says the Gemara, Shaim Mace, if he dies, the cause of Laploni, right? If he dies, then his nechosim go to so and so. Now, matana. What is a matana? Called shekosavo mahayom ula achemisa. So uh, now, this is the, the 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 gift that's similar to the shkif mara, to the deathbed uh, daiki. What kind of matana we're talking about? We're not talking about the matana of a healthy person. We're talking about the matana called shekosavo. He writes in the gift. He he writes a star. I'm giving you, Michael, a gift. I want this gift I'm giving you. I'm healthy. I'm fine. I'm good. But I want you to only have this, meaning you, let's say you want to give it to your son, your daughter, your cousin, whatever. I want you to have it after I die. I'm 100% healthy. I can live 50 more years. But I want this to be your gift. That's a matona that's similar to a daitike. So when the Mishnah says Daitike and Matana, they mean one and the other, but this gift is to the exclusion of the healthy gift that I give you today, and it's Chal today. Right? Okay, we get it. So now, um, let's take a look at Rashi. Matana, Matnas Bori, Ezehi, Kol Shekosim, Mahayom La'achamisa, Guf HaKarka, the actual Karka, let's say the, the land, Konolo Min Hayom. He's toning it today, meaning he can't give it to somebody else. The Anglo Old Rushus Lamakro of Litna or Low Russia, but you can't give it to anybody else. Baha Peros and Oho called Yamav, Chayot, and Al Akhamisa. You know what this is equivalent to? If you want to understand it in our parlance, it's the equivalent of being a trustee in a gift that you give. You're a trustee, you give the gift, the gift doesn't, the gift is given to the person you're giving it to, but you're the trustee. You can eat all the Paris and do everything that you want while you're alive. It means in name only, the receiver has a piece of ground, but he has no benefit from the ground because you, as the trustee, can eat from it as long as you want. That's pshat, a matnas, a, a bari that's conditional. 
that's a, a healthy gift that's conditional. It's conditional because you can have it, but not now. I have the benefit of, 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 um, for, of forever. Now, right? now, but here's the big problem. Alma Iksiva Mahayom Alachamisa Hudikani. So we see, what do we see? That if he gives this gift for Hayom, in other words, this, not the healthy gift, but the gift, conditional gift, he gives it Mahayom Alachamisa. So Hudikani. So if he dies, he's Kona. The Elo, Lo Kani. But if he hasn't died, he's not Kani. Right? So wait a minute. Says Rashi, the Elo Lokani bit me up. Question mark. What, what kind of gift is that? What kind of gift are you giving to somebody and he's not kind of the gift? You want to give it to him as a gift. Kolshke di Mjovale Guf Uperis Vamaaksha the Kani Tfe. So here Rashi distinguishes what we've been talking about because I already introduced you to the fact that there is a gift that has conditions. But Rashi is telling us, because Rashi is astounded, or, or you might be astounded by saying, I can give a gift and then undo the gift. So the, yes, of course you can. The Teretz is that there's two kinds of gifts. There's a gift that you give that's irreversible. You're giving it today and it belongs to him. And there is a gift that's a conditional gift that, and again, like you said, Michael, I'm sure these gifts are given all the time. This is yours if you're married. If you never marry, you don't get it. So that's a gift, but it's not a gift, but it's not a but it's a conditional gift. So that's how we understand a conditional gift like a shrivmara. And now in secular law, it gets complicated because if you give that gift and you memorialize it and you say it's a conditional gift, can you retract? That's a separate issue. Al pihalacha, you may retract. You may retract a conditional gift that you gave while you're healthy because it's just like a, a gift of a shivmara, right? That's not so simple because in, in, in secular law, you write stories and how can you undo it? It becomes problematic. You, you, made, a, you made a trust for somebody and, that's, and now you want to undo the trust and you go to court. I mean, it's complicated. It's not complicated. You gave the gift. The gift was conditional. You have a right until you die to undo it. Right, so, so so that answers that question. Oma baya hocha kama ezu hu matonas bari she matnas shivmara. What is a matona of a healthy person that is like a shivmara? The lokoni el la achamisa that you don't count it until after misa. Culture kosovo mahayoy el la achamisa. Okay, so now we've established those three types of gifts. So now let's go back to our basic kasha. We'll finish with this. What's the basic kasha? The Gemara, the Mishnah says that if you that um, that if you give such a gift and you say I give it, it's okay. In other words, if, if you're Maiden, you're the benefactor, the giver, and you say I give it, it's okay, right? If you don't say it, then you can't give it to either. So the, so Tama de law ama tsuno. So we see that it all now depends on the, the giver, the one who made the gift. If he says, I gave it, yes, this gift this way, it's fine. If he says, I didn't give it, and that's what the Mishnah says. The Mishnah says it's up to the giver. Break the Gemara, the Ramina, I'll ask you a kasha from a brisa, Mozart died because. Apotikas matanas. If if um, if if a person found in the street a daitika, apotika is like a, a trust document. Umatanas afa modim lo yaksa lo You don't return it at all. You don't give it not to one, not to other. That's like our situation in Gittin and Shtar Shichur, right? Where we see that there is an opposing view that you don't give it to either, right? So. How can you in the Mishnah say that by daitika, there you can give it? It's up to you to say, yes, I gave it or not. We see a Brysa that contradicts this Mishnah. You know, we know Brysas have uh, are, are parallel, but not whatever, not the same. So the Kasha, but still it's a Kasha from a Brysa. That Brysa says you may not give it to him. Lo, lo lezer, lo lezer. 
you shouldn't return to either because of the ramifications, which we'll go into more detail. So how can you say in the Mishnah that now with this daitike, you found the daitike and you can give it to him. If he says, yes, give it, I meant to give it. It's a beferish of Raisa that says no. So let's just look at, look at Rashi. Um, for Oma Tanu Nosun, I'm a Smith and Porach. It's a Kasha on the Mishnah. The Tolitama, Bishani Oma, Nimla, Kalem, Shlo, Nitnam. And here and we see that you can't. Apotikis, Shosolo, Sada Apotiki was like a, a Shibu document on a Lamalve. And that was what we, what we call a, a trust document. A Pisha Hoysolo, I love Malve Yishena. Lo Yachzir, he shouldn't return it. Now, here, why shouldn't he return it? Shema Kosva Lose, again. The Gemara doesn't enunciate it, but it's our 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 situation. Maybe he what he um, uh, he wrote it for one person below Mosalo, and he didn't give him the daitike below below um, below Zocha and he decides to remember a daitike is a conditional, so he didn't give it. So all intents and purposes, it's not actual, right? Then what does he do? Mosalo and he gives it to a second person. And the second person gets it as a regular gift, a regular gift, a bori gift. So you have the first gift was a daitike, which is conditional, but he never gave it. And then he decides, you know what? I really want my friend to have this. He gives him an outright gift, which is irreversible, irreversible. So again, Shema Kasvala Zevalo Masala. The daitike he wrote for one person and he didn't give it, or or the let's call it the conditional gift, the conditional gift. And the second person is Zocha. Now he has Charata that he gave it to the second person. says He says, you know what? My first instinct instincts were correct. I wanted to give it to the first person. So what's going to happen is the star is lost. And he says, no, give it to the first person. He has no right to give it to the first person because the second person already was tone it with a healthy gift. But he's going to do trickery. And then what's going to happen? The first person is going to prove that it's his because he's going to show a star that was dated before the second guy. The star of the first person was dated, let's say, Nissan. The star of the second guy was dated Tishrei. He never gave it to the first guy because it was a die to gay, and he gave it outright to the second guy in Tishrei. Who's the real owner? The guy in Tishrei, because he got an outright gift. But now comes, it's, it's already months later, it's Hanukkah, and he says, wait a minute, I did a mistake here. I gave it to him. I should have really given it to the first guy. He can't do anything about it. His good fortune, it's lost. They come to him and they say, here is this star. This star. Who does it belong to? Now he says, now is my opportunity to make good on what I did wrong. I'm going to give it to the first guy who I meant to give it to in the first place. But that's wrong because the second guy already has a Kenyan. He made a Kenyan on a Matana, but he's going to undo it. And lest you say we're going to protect him, we won't protect him because the first guy is going to go to bed and say, it's really mine. You see my date? It's last Nissan. This guy has a date on Tishrei. I owned it already. He didn't because it was a Daitike, but who's going to know? So that is the Gemara's Kasha. That's why the Gemara says, lo lezeh velo lezeh, because you're going to confuse the whole thing because the giver can't make up his mind. A die to decay, a gift, not a die to decay. If it's never lost, then fafal, the second guy has it. But once it's lost, he can now do a trickery on the court and say, the first guy really owns it, even though the halacha of the second guy owns it because it was a gift of a healthy person. That, that's where it starts getting confusing. And, and that mitzvah, so next week, the Gemara is really going to get into this in a more confusing way. But I think we'll get it because we understand the ramifications here. That's why the Gemara says in this particular, the Mandama who says, lo lezeh, lo lezeh, is really protecting the integrity of the situation because if a person changes his mind, if it's a daitike, full rights to change your mind. But if he gave a healthy gift, that you can't change your mind. And if he's an opportunist, 
to change his mind because it was lost, that's not right. Okay, so that, okay, so we'll, we'll have to review this quickly as we go forward, but that's shot here in the die ticket. It's good according to the one who says that, um, uh, that um, uh, when you give a die ticket, okay, you have the rights to retrieve it, but, but, uh, but in, a, in a healthy, in a case of a regular die ticket, but where you confuse a die ticket and a healthy gift in one episode, that's when you start having problems. So uh, I mean, the, the Torah in its wisdom made that distinction that a gift is not a gift and, uh, and depending on how you give it and what the circumstances are and what you utter in the course of giving of the gift. So um, um, it's, it, maybe it's a warning to all of us in our own affairs is that you wanna be clear in what you do. If you give a gift, uh, fine, give a gift. It's no problem. If you don't want to give a gift or you're reluctant to give a gift and you want to give a die ticket or not a die ticket, you want to give a, 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 a gift while you're healthy that is like a die ticket in terms of condition, then, and we all theoretically would do that, right? I mean, we all in our own lives can, can do that. Then there lies, there, there is a little bit of, a, of a, an issue that lies there. Uh, everything could be fine, but there could be problems uh, where, where, um, where, as you see from the Gemara here, how that arises. So where there's a where will, there's a, there's, will a there's a way. That's well said. That's well said. That's well said. This And, and this is full employment act for lawyers. Let's be honest. Full <laughs> Gemara. All right. So a, a little bit of a taste for next week. So we have to <laughs> put our thinking caps on because next week we're going to go through a, a, a very interesting sort of unusual twisted Back and forth in the Gemara, so uh, Mitzvah Hashem will be will be up to it. This should be an nichumim to whatever degree we can for the uh, for the great tragedy in Kal Yisrael. Hopefully, our Torah learning will uh, will be as chus refua and for the neshamas that were lost. Amen. 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 Amen.